Welcome and thank you for attending this evening's meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. The agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room for you to follow along. There will be two opportunities this evening to address the board. The first being agenda item 6.1 and the first set of public comments is relative to agenda item 7.1 through 10.4. Please state the agenda items you are referencing at the beginning of your comments. The second opportunity is agenda item 12.1. There is a sign-up sheet located on the table in the back of the room, and each speaker will have five minutes to address the board, and a timer will be shown on the screen. And with that, Ms. Marshall, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bell? Here. Dr. Nestor Baker? Here. Ms. Cotter? Here. Mr. Villardo? Here. Mrs. Davidson? Here. Will you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, up first tonight, uh, district highlights and recognitions, and I'm going to pass it over to Rick Villardo. Thank you, President Davidson. We are very excited. We're always excited to do these district uh, recognitions and highlights for just some of the incredible work that is done by staff students uh, just across the district. I'm going to go to the podium and I'm going to ask my fellow board members, Ms. Marshall, to uh, line up here in front and we will um, greet the uh, person who is receiving this award. Uh, Dr. Kellogg, we are not inviting you up at this particular time. Okay. Sit there and behave. This is a, uh, an award of recognition from Junior Achievement. Junior Achievement is an outstanding organization, and I know you're going to hear more about that in just a moment, so I'd like to have uh, Mike Davis to come up. He's the president of Junior Achievement to present the Educator of the Year Award. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mike Davis, president of Junior Achievement of Central Ohio. Um, on behalf of the 31,000 students that benefited from our programs last year, uh, 4,000 volunteers engaged with us. We worked with school districts in 17 counties, 48 different districts, had thousands of educators, and each year we recognize an educator of the year. It may be a teacher in the classroom, it could be at any level in education. And on behalf of the thousands of educators that partnered with us last year, um, your own John Kellogg is the recipient. On November 21st, we have a Central Ohio Hall of Fame event that we recognize two business leaders, an educator of the year and a volunteer of the year. And John is um, a leader, a collaborator, a partner. Um, there's a lot of conversation in education and, and workforce development and youth workforce development where we spend our focus on preparing young people for success in their lives. And in Westerville, you do a fabulous job. We appreciate all the schools, all the teachers, everyone. But we're recognizing on behalf of the excellence in the district, um, John, for his outstanding work in partnering with us, with you as educators, and with the community. So, John, congratulations and well deserved. So Mike, um, I'll let him shake hands. He, you look good up there. You take that spot for the rest of the night if you like. The table's right back there. <laughs> Mike, thank you on behalf of, uh, of the district and, and Junior Achievement. We really appreciate, um, you know, you guys really created this opportunity when you reached out to us and, and, and we started talking about these possibilities. And so really my role in this was just to get you and our, your folks with the right people here. And I want to take time to to thank our folks, not only the board, but there's some people in the room who did a lot. Scott Reeves is back there. Uh, Jen Knapp did a lot for us. Um, Ann Baldwin's back there. Uh, they all, and Barb Wallace is not here this evening. They all did a tremendous amount getting principals involved, teachers involved, the kids involved. Janet Davis helped us from the chamber in terms of getting volunteers in the room. So there were a whole lot of people who made this happen. I just 
made the collisions that, that got things going. So thank you for helping us and, and for bringing the program to our kids. We're looking forward to this year. I was in a meeting recently with Scott and the secondary team, and they're already talking about gearing up for this year. So I think the numbers I remember from you uh, from the close of last year, we had uh, over 6,000 students participate in junior achievement last year, which is a lot. So, so we appreciate that partnership and look forward to some more. And I'm very humbled by award, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, 4.1, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the Board of Education meeting held September 23rd, 2019? Second. Any comments? Ready? Hearing none. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Florida? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 5.1, Sorry, we should, I should start over. Um, we have two reports this evening. We're gonna start with 5.1, Westerville Workforce Alliance, and Dr. Hopkins is gonna start us off. Good evening, Ms. Davidson, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg, Ms. Marshall. I'm joined by Janet Tressler Davis, the president and CEO of Westerville Area Chamber. Jason Bechtold's with us as well. He is the economic development director for the city of Westerville and Ann Baldwin, our own Westerville City Schools Career Tech and College Readiness Coordinator. Um, and we're here tonight to speak about our work um, in designing a Westerville Talent Assessment and Development Strategy. I believe you have a handout in front of you as well if you'd like to kind of follow along some of the highlights. We look forward to sharing. Oh, sure. My, my teacher voice has <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jill. Um, as I mentioned, we're here with um, we have Janet Tressler Davis, Jason Bechtold, and Ann Baldwin. And we look forward to sharing tonight some, a high-level summary of our team's progress and how this work may inform the development of meaningful learning experiences for our students. So I'd like to go ahead and ask Janet and Jason to present. There we go. Good evening, President. Davidson, Board of Education members, Treasurer Marshall, and Superintendent Kellogg. It's a pleasure for us to come tonight to talk to you about our study. This is an agreement through the partnership that was made about um, nine months ago. The study took about seven months. We um, all agreed to use a company called Boyette Strategic Advisors. They came uh, very well recommended from Otterbein University and the city because they use them for different projects on their campus. So we're the couple things that we want to talk to you about tonight are our objectives for the study. And I won't go into a lot of detail on those, but to overall high level, we want to maximize the ability of what we're doing and putting our businesses in contact with our educators and making sure that we're aligning curriculum for the jobs that are today. And we're also, everybody likes to do marketing. We certainly want to be able to market our community for what we've offered in this study. 
because we can help recruit new businesses. And then we also can make sure that we're retaining our current businesses to say, hey, look how great Westerville is. Make sure you stay here and you made a good choice to come here. We uh, surveyed about 3,565 responses back from either individual surveys or from face-to-face -face contact with businesses or group setting of businesses. And we interviewed and had survey responses from guidance counselors in our Westerville district, our school students um, at the high school level, and Otterbein students. And of those, 3,000 were from our Westerville school students. Amazing turnout, great. And we have an example of a slide to share with you of one of the survey questions that we thought was pretty telling, and we thought maybe we'd just pull this one out to share with you, is who or what is the most influential in choosing your career path. And you would s certainly think parents, mother, father might uh, be elevated, and it is. If you put those all together, it's a little over 32%. But the only single item that um, received about 27.6% is life experiences. So we think about that where mentorships, the importance of those, hands-on experiences in the classroom, bringing guest speakers in. In fact, some of the work that Dr. Kellogg and the team have been doing with all the career pathways, excellent. So as you can see, it does complement what our students are feeling would really help them grow. This map looks a little bit confusing and a little bit overwhelming, but um, we find it very helpful. And when I say we, the group that's moving and advancing these outcomes from this study is our, we're calling it a workforce alliance team, and it's still made up of the partners. And we're pleased to have Paul and Ann uh, continuing on to that committee. And then we have six representatives from various businesses, and we've invited Warm from the community. And that group has committed to meet every month, and we are looking at these assets. So these are workforce assets in the region. And we kind of broke them down so that you can see in that inner circle. There are sources that provide employment services, sources that provide work uh, for human capital, supportive services, and connective organizations. So we're trying to meet with as many, many of those so that we can understand what they provide and be almost like a traffic controller uh, when our businesses are talking to us to say we can provide them some help. It might not be right in our own community or it might be outside. When we interviewed our businesses, we found out that many of them either had not heard of any of the resources or the ones that they had heard of, they weren't sure how to access them. So we're going to hopefully have a group of educated people to know how to do that. And I'll turn the next part over to Jason. Sounds good. Move this up a good evening. Uh, wanted to touch upon the recommendations from this uh, strategy and in your, on the back side of the executive summary that we provided to uh, the board uh, showcases uh, the recommendations. So we compiled all the survey data, census data, em employment uh, interviews, uh, and other workforce development stakeholders to develop uh, kind of four um, uh, different segments of the recommendations. And, uh, and Janet touched upon the system alignment piece. Uh, that is definitely a low-hanging fruit opportunity uh, for us to, to make sure that all the workforce programs that are available, our businesses are taking advantage of, and that workforce alliance is going to play a critical role uh, in that uh, alignment and getting the word out there. Uh, and then there's three others, talent development, talent attraction, and uh, business development, which I'll touch upon. Uh, the talent development um, has a series of recommendations, but I'll touch upon the soft skills development and in integration. Uh, that's huge. Uh, whether it's a manufacturing company or an IT company, uh, those soft skills are definitely uh, a need. Uh, a lot of the companies that we're talking to have, you know, they're, they're comfortable with teaching them the technology, but it's those interpersonal communication skills uh, that, that they need uh, for that particular employee. Uh, the second one I'll touch upon is the, the marketing material. Uh, a lot of the workforce development providers are come see me and come talk to me. I think w with the, the Westerville way and that collaboration that we have with the Westerville partnership, we can be that vehicle and from a marketing perspective uh, for our businesses because we're in two counties. There's uh, in Delaware and Franklin, there's different programs for each of those counties. Um, being that traffic controller, I think is a major uh, opportunity. And then also outreach strategies for the disengaged workforce. Our unemployment rate is rock bottom. Our labor participation rate is at an all-time high. Uh, and, and so 
developing strat outreach strategies for that disengaged workforce is something that we need to work together on uh, because that's uh, that next stage of talent that, that's missing uh, and upskilling those, those folks so that they can um, reach their potential. The next piece is uh, talent attraction. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of opportunities here, especially in the high demand occupations like software development, uh, that's industry uh, independent. There's a lot of uh, interest in developing that talent from uh, outside uh, as it relates to software development and then really increase brand recognition. What we have with the Westerville partnership is rare. Uh, Westerville was designated top seven intelligent community in 2019 because of this partnership that we have with the city, schools, library, chamber, and Audubon University. Uh, so there's, there's some exciting opportunities to, from, from a brand recognition that we can leverage. And then as Janet mentioned, you know, it's about exposing the students. Uh, it's don't tell me, show me. Uh, and, and having conversations about healthcare. You may not like needles, but may, you may be interested in the healthcare sector or logistics. It's not always about driving a truck. There might be there's strategies and um, you know, supply chain opportunities that uh, students can get exposed to. So having those conversations with industry as well as our educational providers, I think is an incredible uh, opportunity. And then lastly, uh, business development uh, and support recommendations. <coughs> What we're seeing from an economic development level, uh, companies are interested in the school districts. And I think we have a compelling case to talk to, com to companies that we're working on the, the workforce that you'll need 10 years from now. That seventh and eighth grader that's in school in our Westerville City Schools right now, uh, that we're preparing them so that they can be, uh, that, so that the company can be competitive and that they have a great talent pipeline coming uh, th through the system. Uh, as well as um, C, uh, CEO roundtables, having those conversations on the latest, greatest of technology. And then uh, I can't say enough about the uh, Business Advisory Council. That's just an incredible opportunity uh, that you've started uh, to engage businesses in terms of um, curriculum alignment. So with that said, uh, there was a lot of contributors to this. This was a very unique uh, enterprise. And, I'll, uh, and we're very excited that the private sector's uh, significant involvement in this. Uh, with that said, I'll turn it over to Ann. Good evening. I just want to highlight how lucky I feel that we are in Westerville to have such great business uh, partnerships, that we are excited in our Business Advisory Council to be building a list of essential skills that our students need to be successful, not only in school, but in the workplace and in life. And we're able to leverage then the Workforce Alliance to um, make sure we're capturing the work of the entire community. And we have businesses at the table ready to work with us. And we're, we're looking forward to those conversations to start to build those student experiences this next year. So at this time, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Jason. <laughs> 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 it's, it's not a hard one. You were talking about the disengaged workers. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could describe for us what a disengaged worker in this particular area looks like. Um, uh, great question. I, I think we're coming at it where we did a population map of some of our workers currently. And um, some of the, the great companies, high paying job companies, and we noticed a lot of them are in the 270 outer belt <coughs> and, uh, and, uh, and also including Delaware County. And so there was pretty distinct uh, south of 270 along Cleveland Avenue. I think there's an opportunity with uh, mobility is a big issue uh, with, with the workforce, disengaged workforce. And so having uh, CODA and the CMAX opportunity and then leveraging that uh, with those stops, they go all the way from Columbus State downtown all the way to Polaris. <coughs> We have an opportunity to create that mobility option for folks, um, not just along the 270 outer belt in Delaware County, but also all the way downtown Columbus. So that population it just expands in terms of the workforce that you can that you can uh, attract and and uh, retain in your community. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah. Um, hey Nance, can I can I ask for it? Yeah. Would you would you because uh, uh, I I wrote down that same thing. Is, is disengage, disengaged uh, similar to, would you say, um, underemployed? Yes. 
Thank yes. you. That's that's to what I'm hearing, and I thought I that's I normally think that way. Sorry. Go ahead. So I was thinking of underemployed, mm -hmm. and when you bring up the mobility piece. Uh, mobility and transportation, that's a key driver of underemployment for a lot of population in the central Ohio area, I know. Um, I was also thinking of um, some other components that often lead to a disengaged workforce. You know, for instance, uh, reentry programs, when we look at people who have served time, and how we deal with, you know, reentry programs in this particular area, how we link that up with our mobility services, that then led me to think of something not necessarily related to reentry. Um, Columbus State, I think only at its downtown campus, has a partnership with Franklin County Job and Family Services where they've developed a one-stop shop for supportive services. And as I think about the supportive service piece and the Workforce Alliance uh, components, you know, that uh, running interference and helping to make things happen, as we expand our partnership and our efforts together, I would hope that we're able to eventually look at how we address supportive services with some, some components of one-stop shopping now that we have some models that seem to be working in central Ohio. And they are focused on uh, those components that create stressors that keep people either underemployed or out of the workforce altogether, uh, as well as keeping them within the uh, training uh, and higher education that they need to be successful in some of the jobs that they are reaching for. So I was really pleased to see the diagram that you all put together and the connection. It's basically a Venn diagram if you think about it in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's right, you knew I would. And all of those different components and the building of the human capital that is necessary requires all of those other pieces. I'm really excited about what you're doing. I don't have lots of questions for you, although the data that you shared made me want to sit down with you and ask lots of questions about, you know, what kind of response you got here and what you got there. Uh, this is good stuff. I'm pleased with some of the um, components that I see connecting to curricular delivery changes that we have made in the school district thus far uh, over the past few years as we look at the increase of embedding soft skill development within academic delivery. That's really important for the work that you're talking about, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we further embed uh, development of soft skills as well as those experiential lessons that you're talking about, which often those go hand in hand. So thank you very much. I've been very excited about this work and eager to hear about it. Anybody else? I have a question. Um, I was just wondering, uh, with the underemployed, are you looking at particular ranges of ages or just the full gamut of adults, younger adults? I think that, that what we're focusing on is all spectrums. So I, I think part of that Workforce Alliance is to have everybody at the table uh, in terms of the services that are provided at all stages for the underemployed. A lot of times those programs are based on particular age ranges. so. It's just something to think about. The fact that um, when you saw that asset map that you had, we're straddled between two counties, which is unique for Westerville. So when you find a jobs and family services in Franklin County, we just had the Delaware one at our meeting last month, very different in when the services that they provide. So that's the other thing is that we have to find out what Delaware provides. What, and then will Delaware still entertain assistance to, at a Franklin County business? And we, we've learned that they would. We have to find out if that's going to be the other way too. So we have a lot of learning to do. So are we, I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm I sorry. was just wondering, are we looking at using some of this information, which I think the report is great. I'm glad you guys are collaborating this way. Um, are we looking at it for any additional career tech type programs in Wasserville? Or I was just wondering about that. I, I, I think the exercise that we're going to be doing over the next six months, 12 months, is to, uh, I think Paul said it best, we're, we're in the stage of learning, because there's a lot of programs out there that the, this study does not touch, that we're going to, with the Business uh, Workforce Alliance that's trying to figure it all out, taking in all this information. And then there's, the, so there's the learning piece, then there's the, the leveraging pieces of all the assets that are, that are going on, and then there's the linking between, between the two and, and providing those recommendations and, and allowing that forum, um, whether it's, um, a tech program or, or what have you. I think we're still in the early stages with this in terms of all the programs that are available and then there's what's missing or what's being duplicated. So I think that's kind of the strategy that we have currently right now. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate it. 
So just one quick question. As you were surveying, um, particularly the kids, was there anything that bubbled up that surprised you? I, I don't know the particular, well, you want to? Or anything that came up over and over again, well, or? Was, was great is their awareness through those, the survey was, was fantastic about, you know, college degrees, whether I, I'm going to work during my, during uh, my, after high school or I'm going to work right after high school. They're, they're this, the survey kind of showed me at least, the students are deep in thought in terms of what their next step is. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think there is an opportunity uh, through an or some type of orientation or to understanding all the careers that could be, um, I think that's a great opportunity. They're willing to hear. Uh, and I think this, the timing is fantastic where you see them interested in trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. uh, not be carried with l large student loans uh, after uh, what, what their post high school career, uh, but then also industry is leaning in as well. So I think this, this, this timing is, is, is fantastic. And I think that was something I learned is these students are incredibly engaged in terms of what's next for them after high school. Great. And just to follow up, um, one of the um, kind of ahas for us was the, um, just their openness to um, saying that maybe a four-year degree isn't the only option for me, is that there are great jobs, great opportunities that maybe an associate's degree can start for them, and then as they work, they could continue on to a four-year degree. So I think it was just that you know, openness to, wow, there are some opportunities out there that you know, that traditional four-year degree may be great for me down the road, but maybe initially there are some work experiences, some experiential learning that will ensure that this is the career I think I want to go down to before I invest a lot of money into a four-year degree down that way. So it is interesting to see how the students are really paying a lot of attention to the opportunities out there for them. Great. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Okay, our next report, uh, 5.2, is College and Career Readiness, and Ann Baldwin will be back with Scott Reeves this time. All right. Well, thank you, President Davidson, Dr. Kellogg, and members of the board. I am here with my colleagues, Dr. Jennifer Knapp, Ann Baldwin, and Kaylee Nestor Baker. And we're going to share what I believe are um, some pretty impressive increases in the opportunities that we provided for students to engage in college and career ready curriculum. What we'll share over the next several slides is the impact of the district's commitment to career technical, to College Credit Plus to advanced placement, international baccalaureates, the assessments that we provide, <coughs> and middle school opportunities that we have established to prepare our students. So we are comparing most of our uh, increases to the 13-14 school year as a baseline. That year is the last year before we began many of our initiatives uh, within the college and career readiness area. So if you recall back in the 14-15 school year, we were part of a pretty large state A uh, straight A grant from our state, and it involved 14 school districts, Harvard's Jobs um, Pathway to Prosperity Network, Jobs for the Future out of Boston, and Columbus State. And we were developing with 14 other school districts pathways that led students to career experiences that could lead to credentials or college coursework that were in growth, economic growth areas of our region. We began that in 2014-15. Also that same year, the state moved away from the PSEO format and entered into what we have now, the College Credit Plus format, which has allowed more students to access actual college coursework. As we were providing more opportunities for students, it was also very, very important for us to make sure that all of our students had access and opportunities to these rigorous coursework and to college coursework, college level coursework and career technical coursework. So we entered into a shared grant um, agreement with Equal Opportunity Schools out of Seattle in their lead hire initiative to provide more access to our minority and low income students to these higher level courses. And then we began to um, assert and invest in college 
preparation assessments, and I'll share some of that data as well. And as we were preparing our high school students for these rigorous opportunities, we wanted to make sure that as we move through into last year, we wanted to make sure that we were providing the proper foundation at the middle level so that these students could be successful. So at this time, I'll invite Ann Baldwin to talk about our career technical programming. Good evening. I'm excited to share with you that our enrollment in career technical education continues to increase every year. Um, career technical education is important because it can provide the technical, academic, and employability skills that students need to be successful not only in high school and or college, but in their careers and life. Prior to the implementation of career pathways at our high schools, students could access career technical education only through our career centers. And so students have an opportunity to attend a career center as a junior and senior. And our students are fortunate to have three career center opportunities at Columbus Downtown High School, Fort Hayes Career Center, and Delaware Area Career Center. And we have seen some increase student enrollment in those career center programs. You see there that we actually have 1,245 student enrollments in career tech courses this school year. And that is in our career pathways, business logistics, engineering, and health. Our students are able to enroll in a pathways course at any time in their high school career. It is an elective course. And it's a neat opportunity if a student jumps in their freshman year and decides they love it, they can continue on throughout their high school career. They may even find that they have a passion for a particular career area and go to a career center to further their skills. Or they might find that they really, that's not for them or they don't like it. And that's just as important to us too. And they might be then able to try another career pathway. Um, so we have seen great enrollment in those courses. We continue to think about how we help students and families understand their options and um, schedule those options. This does not include all of our middle school students that are engaged in career technical coursework right now. All of our seventh graders take engineering design and medical detectives, which is new this year. And then our eighth graders have an opportunity to take another engineering course called Engineering Extreme. It's a really exciting class our students are doing this year. They're able to take the basics that they learned in seventh grade and focus more on projects for others in eighth grade. And this is the first year that we've been able to offer career tech coursework in both seventh and eighth grade, which is pretty exciting. We also have seen an increase in our college credit plus enrollment over time. We received um, 14, 15 when the program first started, we had 76 students enrolled. To this year, we have 425 students enrolled in college coursework. And that is just based on fall semester. I expect us to have some increased enrollment spring semester. We just don't know what courses students are gonna sign up for yet. And what's great about College Credit Plus is that it does open up access to students. Students can take a college course and it count towards their graduation requirements. So um, our students can take, for instance, Composition 1, and that will count as one of their high school courses for graduation, as well as earn three college credit hours for a class that is pretty universal for lots of degrees. I'm proud that we are able to offer College Credit Plus classes in-house so that our students don't have to travel to a college or university to participate in those. We currently offer courses like Composition One in all three of our high schools. And our high school faculty, our adjunct faculty and facilitators for Columbus State Community College. And it's a neat opportunity for our students to get that college experience with someone that they are familiar with and it's scheduled right alongside their high school courses. And it's also a neat opportunity for our instructors to connect with college faculty and um, we can see how what we're teaching even in ninth grade is connected to the college coursework. And next up, Mr. Reeves is going to share about AP and IB. Thank you, Ann. So through our lead hire initiative, along with significant investments uh, by this board and structures put in place by our team, 
I'd like to share with you a little bit of the impact that we've had in providing opportunities for our students to engage with advanced placement coursework. Now, when you look at our baseline year, this is the combined enrollment of our AP courses. So in 2013-2014, our combined enrollment was 1,455. That's not necessarily 1,455 individual students. It's the combined enrollment of all of our courses. So if a student, for example, took AP Bio and AP Gov, that student would count twice in that enrollment. So our enrollment overall was 1,455. Six years later, to this current school year, we currently have 2756. That's an increase of 1,300 students. Put in a percentage, in six years, we've increased the enrollment of our uh, uh, advanced placement courses by 89%. Now, a big part of that was our partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools in the Lead Higher Initiative. That began with us in the 15-16 school year. That was our first year of implementation. So in the first year of our implementation, in the middle of those graphs, we had 1,804 uh, aggregate enrollment in our AP courses. Of that, 78% of the enrollment in those courses were white students. 22% of the aggregate enrollment in those courses were students of all other demographics. And so when you look at the demographics of our school population, we knew very early on, which is why we engaged with the Lead Higher Initiative, that we wanted more access to our low income and minority students to have the same level of rigor and, and access to our higher level curriculum as, as everyone else. Fast forward to this year of our 2756, that's an increase from the time we started with Lead Higher of 950 students. Of that breakdown, 68% are white, 32% are all other demographics. So we've had a significant increase. To break that into raw numbers, in 1516, the enrollment of non-white students was 395. Today it's 891. That's an increase of 496 low-income and minority students. That's a 125% increase of students accessing our advanced placement coursework. And that's, um, for me, pretty amazing. Also with the International Baccalaureate Program, which is a part of the Lead Higher Initiative as well, these are actual students. So in the 2013-2014 school year, we had 157 students registered in the IB coursework. Fast forward to this particular school year, we have 212 students registered to take IB. That's a 35% increase over a six-year period. So why do we attribute the, the growth, one, our involvement with the Lead Higher Initiative that give, had given us strategies to increase student enrollment in those areas, having a full-time IB coordinator in Bill Heinmiller who could devote to nurturing the program not only at Westerville South, but reach out to the four middle schools to talk about the benefits of our International Baccalaureate program and the addition of some International Baccalaureate courses that, were very, that are very, very high interest to our students. And so we've seen great increases in our IB program as well. So in our college and career readiness assessment, a little bit of background. In 1617, the state of Ohio began funding a college readiness assessment for all juniors across the state. So that year, we began, uh, the, we made the selection with our state to give the ACT test for all of our juniors really because that was the test that the majority of our students were taking when they were paying for it. We also did that again in 17 and 18. In 17 and 18, also, we were able to reallocate some existing district funds to support all of our 10th graders taking the PSAT test, which, by the way, they take tomorrow is the PSAT test day. In 18, 19, last school year, the fruits of we awarded last board meeting with seven National Merit semifinalists. Last year, we were able to reallocate additional district funds to support all 10th graders and all 11th graders taking the PSAT. 
So in conversations that we were having on our end with the significant investment that we were making in increasing the enrollment in AP courses, with the investments that we were making in having our 10th grade students and our 11th grade students take the PSAT test, we felt that our, our investment in the college board and their alignment at the college board with the Ohio content standards, we felt that the state test that we were going to administer to the juniors would be better served that if we went with the SAT, we would be greater aligned with the work that they were doing and the investments that they were making and would give more of our students a better chance to hit those college readiness benchmarks and perform. And this is the results that we had. This is comparing the ACT test that we gave all of our juniors in 2018 and last year's juniors, which are this year's current seniors who took the SAT in 2019. And you can see the number of students in the ACT in 2018 that in English and reading that hit the college readiness benchmarks. And you can see down there what, what the college readiness benchmarks are. 18 for English, 22 for reading. We had 48% just over and 39% of our students hit the college readiness benchmark. In the evidence-based reading and writing section of the SAT, the equivalent, 66% of our kids hit the college readiness benchmark. That's a significant increase. Go over to the math side, 38% of our kids, 39% of our kids in 2018 with the ACT hit the college readiness benchmark. That went up over 50% of our kids and so we're very very excited about that we are administering again in march the sat and in hopes that that's the norm and that is the the plateau that our students reach and and continue to ascend and we will continue to stick with the sat because we believe it aligns with the work that we've been doing and at this time i'd like to transition to kaylee nester baker who will talk about the work we've done in middle school Good evening. So as we were doing all of this wonderful work at the high school with Lead Higher and opening up opportunities for our high school students, we started hearing from lots of different groups within the district and the community about the importance of opening up those opportunities to our students at the middle school level. So allowing them to access advanced coursework. We already had the advanced coursework in place, so it was opening up the opportunities for our students in seventh and eighth grade to access those and then get the foundational skills and the experience to then go on and be successful in their high school advanced coursework. So, I have transitions here. So we have our enrollment growth. We started our self-select last school year, the 2018-2019 school year. So this is our aggregate growth between the 2017-18 school year and this school year. These are the number of seats that we have in our advanced courses in seventh and eighth grade, ELA, science, social studies, and math. So we had 692 students or seats in those courses in 17-18 school year. Those were primarily for our gifted students and then we opened it up to students who are not identified as gifted. And this year we're seeing 2880 in our number of seats that have been filled by students in those courses. And the increase is shown across the board in our subgroups as well. Our subgroups non-white are showing more than double the amount of seats are filled by our students who are non-white in those courses for this year. And then when we look at our eighth graders, so we're talking about going from middle school into high school, we wanted to see what happened with our students who were eighth graders last year and what they decided to take as ninth graders this year. So it looks like 87% of our students who took advanced coursework as an eighth grader opted to take at least one advanced course as a ninth grader this year. So 87%, I think that's a pretty good number. I'm pretty excited about that. And that is across the board, ELA, science, math, and social studies. And what I also wanted to share with you is, I'm sorry, I lost my, my spot just a minute. It was really important because when we talk about the students who are going into the different pathways, it can be AP, it can be IB, and it can be the CCP courses and the different pathways that go on. So when you look at the pie chart there, that includes the courses that go along with our pathways, our engineering and design courses and our medical and health pathway courses. So it's, it's very exciting work. 
And now I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Jennifer Knapp, who has a lot of other exciting coursework to share with you. Thank you. Well, with that intro, um, so if you're wondering, okay, so what courses are they in? We have all of this increase. Where are they going? So we do have um, quite a few additional course offerings. So that's one of our drivers for this increased enrollment um, are the course offerings that you have approved. So we currently have 20 AP courses and 24 IB, but since uh, this work began, you know, we kind of started this in 1314. We have added, we've actually added four AP. I left off AP statistics. So statistically speaking, I was probably going to make one mistake. Hopefully that's what it is. Um, two of those you can see in computer science and psychology. That was a semester course offering for us, but there was a lot of student interest. Uh, International Baccalaureate adding three courses, and that really stemmed from our IB audit that we did a few years back, uh, which included student surveys. So um, the sports exercise and health science has exploded, and our IB theater course has also been very successful. Uh, College Credit Plus, uh, and it's funny, and, it, and it's on the top right. I remember years ago, we probably five or six, it, I've been around a while, and we were going to offer Calc 2 in-house. That was the very first course. It was a partnership with Otterbein, it was super out of the box thinking for us, but we had a group of seventh graders who successfully completed Algebra One, and we made a commitment to them that we're gonna, you know, you're not gonna have to drive down to OSU. And so we figured out how to do that. And so it's just funny to look back and think how many additional course offerings that we have. And so students can go to Ohio State and various other schools, you know, and, and take college credit courses. But these are the ones that we are able to offer in-house uh, that meet our students needs that fit their schedule um, and so we're really excited about those and I have not looked at my script once so give me a second I just don't want to forget anything okay um, and as and as Mr. Reeves said um, these new courses are in part um, from the creation of the pathways with which began with the straight-A grants uh, and so as you look at intro to engineering and design and principles of engineering, that begins our engineering pathway. Actually, as Ann said, it does begin in grade seven. Uh, these are for high school credit. Uh, and then with um, our health pathway, we have human body systems and principles of biomedical science, which I loved hearing the um, previous presentation and, and Anne said it as well, we want students to try and see if they like it. And that was what we found with human body systems. Know if you want to see blood or not. And why not find that out when you're in 10th grade rather than when you're pre-med? And, and then, you know, that's kind of a different price point for parents. Uh, and also our business and logistics pathway, which I love that um, it was shared about, let me find the course, um, the transportation and traffic management and marketing principles, you know, it's not just all logistics. It's not just moving boxes. There's a lot of different things going on. Um, and our Pathways course, courses support that. So in closing, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Reeves, who will talk about how this all connects with our students' uh, interests. Thank you. Sorry. I'm going to, because you still all have a straight face, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of re, re regroup. <clears throat> the number of kids that are accessing <laughs> career technical coursework compared to six years ago is staggering. The number of kids who are increasing their advanced placement coursework from six years ago is astonishing. And when you look at articles that are written around the country of suburban areas and cities just like ours who are rapidly diversifying but have created de facto segregation within their schools delineated by their coursework. And we have gone exactly opposite of that is to be commended. The amount of college credits that our kids are earning almost more than half in-house because of the investments that we've made investments that we've made 
since 2013-2014 within the resources that we've had, as Dr. Kellogg shared in the last uh, board report, at a cost lower than districts like us, at a rate that I would, and an outcome, I would hold up with anybody in the state of Ohio. We could not have done that without the vision and leadership of this board. We could not have done that without Dr. Kellogg, Treasurer Marshall, Bart. The team behind me is as talented as a team and those principals and assistant principals and teachers in the classroom as you will ever find. And this may be the most powerful thing that I ever come up here and share with you. And I think of all of that, the most powerful slide is this one. So when we get our report from the, the, 20, the 2020 SAT student cohort preview, that's the juniors last year who took the SAT who are in the cohort of 2020. And that's our seniors this year, seven of which we celebrated for their national success on the PSAT. Well, one of the things that they're asked to do when they fill out all the information to take the SAT is to say, what career areas are you interested in? And these are the top five. The top five that our seniors said are their aspirations are health professions, biological and biomedical sciences. Huh, where have you seen that before? Because we have one of the most robust health pathways that you will find in Central Ohio. They also said, we're very, very interested in the visual and performing arts. And yes, we have begun to make a commitment in that. We've added some coursework at middle school, realigned so more kids could, could take music. We've added IB theater. We've added um, uh, the, the summer theater, which was wonderfully successful in a very artistic community. We have tended to that. And engineering, a pathway which this senior class is the very first class that started the pathways with engineering as seventh graders. We were committed to them at seventh grade to finishing this pathway for them by the time they became seniors, the engineering, and then our business pathway, which we have at all three high schools. So the power in that is the investment that you made, the vision that you have for the kids of this community align almost exactly with the aspirations that they have. And that, to me, is as powerful a thing as a school district could ever share with their community. And so that's our college and career readiness update. And any questions that you may have for any of us? All right, who wants to go first? I'm gonna go uh, on this side this time, because I got in trouble last time. I, I, well, I, I, I wrote a bunch of notes. I'm not gonna share a lot. It's, it is really very exciting. You are correct to commend your team because uh, that team behind you makes you look good, man. Let me just tell you, that, that <laughs> team behind you, they got it going on. Um, you, you're just the eye candy up there doing this. Sorry, D delete that from the tape. Um, I love I love the access and I, I was I was kind of thinking about this and I so we don't define I don't think we define access as just being open we define access as barriers being removed it, it, it's almost always been open but as I think Dr. Kellogg I think you've shared the story it, probably from your experience that some people were not taking these classes and some, sometimes they were asked and they said, well, I didn't know I could. So it was open, yes. but there was a barrier even if it was in their own mind. So I, I, I extrapolated that out that I think your role is to try and <coughs> find the paths of engagement, lifelong learning, and success for these students and remove the barriers our role is to receive the recommendations and the guidance and to remove the barriers for you all to do the good work that you've done. Because I think we are all, I'll just speak for me, straight faced up here because it's, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's almost too much. Like we've increased that much in that little bit amount of time? We've had the pathways and the seniors started and then now they're seniors, which has a whole different issue for me and kind of teary. But I, I just think that that's, 
incredible. And the fact that we reach into the middle schools is just a pretty powerful thing. So my summary, and I, I really I took a bunch of notes, and I just, in my summary, I think it's not just open opportunities, but it is barrier removed opportunities. That's what really gets folks to try. And the second thing is, I am personally honored to have been on a board that has tried to reverse the trend of segregating by opportunities. And we said, we wonder if we can integrate by opportunities. And I think that's the direction we're going. And I commend, I, all kidding aside, I commend you and the team and a whole bunch of people that work on this uh, uh, level here. And obviously, the ones in the classroom who are day in, day out, trying to figure out how can I engage that student who is becoming disengaged? How can I open up their eyes to the opportunities in front of them? And I, and I too, love that last slide, that that's a pretty well-rounded, it, it's, it's, it's just not all careers that are going to get high income. It's not all careers in sciences. It's not all STEM. And I love all of that. But there's also uh, the fine arts was in there. Um, I think it is unbelievably powerful what you all have been able to accomplish in not just opening opportunities, but pushing down barriers and saying, Yes, you can take this course. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, you can take this course. And we'll help you succeed in it. Um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, uh, to you, Scott, uh, Mr. Reeves, and the entire team uh, for the work that you um, are doing and are continuing to do. Um, one question um, that I, well, let me also say um, I'm very excited um, uh, to hear about the increased diversity uh, in participation um, in IB, CCP, um, AP coursework. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, and what uh, you all have done as a team um, to make those opportunities available to all of our students. Um, and I think that starts with an increased sense of awareness um, to where both students and particularly parents um, are aware that these opportunities are available. Um, you just need to you just need to make sure your child is registering for them and taking advantage of them. Um, so I'm very excited to to see that. Um, one question that I have um, with the increased participation in um, particularly AP and CCP, um, have we seen the number? of students who are actually taking the test, have those remained consistent over the past or increased? And of those, are we seeing um, consistent or increased uh, a percentage of those students that are actually not just taking a test, but passing the test or successfully completing the CCP courses? Um, and we are, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we are also um, working with Columbus State to follow up with students that may be struggling earlier in class. And so it's something working with as a partnership. We get starfish early alerts for our students. 
and then I'm able to send those to our counselors to follow up with students as well to give them support if they are struggling in classes. So our students are, that are taking College Credit Plus courses are often successful in doing that. And then if they are struggling, we're working on finding support for those students because they are building a college transcript and that's a big deal to mm -hmm. us and to them. And we want to make sure that we're supporting them along the way. As far as our advanced placement courses, we've not seen any drop in the percentage of kids that are taking the test. There are all there have always been gaps in performances for students and that <clears throat> when when we started with this initiative, uh, a lot of the feedback and we, we got feedback from parents that would said, you know, you're, you're actively recruiting my student to take these courses, but we felt there were barriers to doing that at the middle level, which was instrumental in us opening the preparation mm -hmm. for students to take these advanced courses at the high school level. So this is our fourth year with Equal Opportunity Schools, our third year with kids who we've recruited into these um, courses. We have found the attrition rate to be pretty decent of kids who started as juniors to continue as seniors and to take additional um, AP or IB coursework. Well, IB is most of is a two-year program anyway, and they do really uh, far better as a second year kid. So we actually on October 30th have a full day professional development with about eight to 10 AP and IB teachers from all three schools and we pair that up with Pickerington who's also in the lead hire program and we have a full day professional development on how do we provide supports to our students? What does research say are the best mechanisms for our students to be successful? How do we provide support for our teachers to be able to engage and help those students? So our professional development on the 30th which is at Westerville North we host in the fall, Pickerington hosts in the spring and we did that last year and we're doing that again this year. So. Uh, we're on the journey. We're not at the destination. And, and we realize what we need and the supports that our students need and the supports that our staff need to be successful. So we're, we're, we're always work, working on that. Okay. Um, can you explain to me again um, why we made the switch from the SAT or from the okay. uh, ACT to the SAT? Okay. We just felt it better aligned with the investments that we were making. So. When, when you look at the SAT, that is under the umbrella of the College Board. The advanced placement courses are under the umbrella of the College Board. The PSAT is, is just what it is. It's the pre-SAT. So we were engaging hundreds and hundreds more students into College Board curriculum. We were engaging entire classes over years it, taking the PSAT test. We felt that the alignment, given the fact that within the, the non-college board courses, the fact that the college board aligned their curriculum with our state content standards, that it was just greater alignment for our students to sit down with the test, that they were far more familiar with the format, with the curriculum. So our juniors who took the SAT for the first time last March, just a few months prior, took the PSAT. And the year before that was the first group to take the PSAT as 10th graders. So they were mentally conditioned for a test of that magnitude. They were familiar with the format. And with so many of them in the AP, we just felt that the alignment and the familiarity was far greater with the SAT than the ACT. And, and we wanted to, to test our theory. We engaged teachers. We went to each high school and engage with the AP teachers who engage with the <coughs> College Board curriculum and got their feedback before we switched and, and you know, we, we kind of threw some things out there and, and made the switch and we were really eagerly awaiting the results and we, we, it was better than what we anticipated. I'm, I'm going to ask you one more thing and All then right. I'll be quiet. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Henry, he got you. <laughs> um, and I don't know the answer. Do we offer um, any kind of assessment somewhere along the line in terms of a career assessment for our students to take? Um, kind of like a Myers-Briggs, um, Kiersey kind of thing to, to say, okay, based off of how you scored on this test, these are some career fields you might want to consider. Do we do that anywhere 
along the line? Yes, we utilize a online format called Naviance, and our students actually begin taking a career cluster inventory in sixth grade in their literacy, <clears throat> excuse me, literacy skills for career exploration course. They'll take that um, cluster finder, it aligns their interests with different career fields, and students actually do a research project on those different career fields that they would find, might find interesting based on what they like to do. Our students also in sixth grade are now taking a strengths explorer, which uh, there, that is the age appropriate strengths finder assessment for students, and they are finding their top three strengths. And then that is also a um, information that our eighth grade counselors are following up on and doing lessons with our students so that they're able to articulate their strengths and learn how their strengths might align with different career opportunities. In high school, our students have opportunity to take the career cluster finder again, as well as a career interest profiler that will give you some additional details about how your interests would line up with different careers. And then I continue to look for other opportunities for our students to take additional assessments, especially at the upper grade levels to uh, help them further articulate how their interests might fit a particular career field. Um, our students do have opportunity to, to take the ASVAB and as a high school student as well. Um. Okay. For, for all the millions of people that are watching this <laughs> on TV, uh, where, where can parents go on our website to get the Naviance and to get that information? So right now on um, the website listed there, there are links to different um, portals. I, our counselor curriculum is one, I know that our high schools and our middle schools have been doing more focused parent workshops around Naviance and utilizing it. What's really exciting is when you log into PowerSchool, there's a little icon in the top right, you can click on it, it takes you right into Naviance, so you don't have to have a separate login or a password, but that is a flyer that I will make sure is up on our website as well, because I don't think it is. I think it's on individual school sites, okay. but I can make sure it's on the district site as well. Okay, thank you. I'm done. You done? No. no. Okay. Scott, I think you already know how I feel about us, but this is just absolutely incredible. In the amount of time that we're talking about in this report, we have absolutely exploded. And in a good way. And I don't think, uh, I was sitting here thinking, how, how do we get this understood? How do we share what amazing work is going on in this school district, in this arena? And I'm still working on it, I'm still thinking about it. Um, but as I, as I was thinking about it, that this is a, an incredibly targeted, determined drive to open up access, to remove barriers, and not just to open the access and remove the barriers that keep kids out, but also to make sure that the supports are available that keep them in, keep them in the coursework, keep them achieving, moving them into greater achievement as they go through the years. This is a superb example of what education should be. We're talking about alignment, we're talking about grade upon grade upon grade alignment, we're talking about alignment with all of the work that actually was just presented earlier um, with the Workforce Alliance work, we're talking about community alignment, we're talking about um, access in a way that reaches students that were never reached before for whatever the reason was. And when they're getting in the classes, my sense is they're achieving, they're making it, they're, they're not sorry they did it, and we're retaining them. That is key. When you were talking about what other districts do, sometimes there's a, a genuine desire to increase access, but without the necessary supports for the teaching staff and for the students themselves, the access simply isn't enough and we are working really hard to circumvent that problem. What I'm wondering though is as we've gone through these years, as we've done the absolutely amazing curricular development that's gone on here in the last few years, which is second to none, what lessons have we learned? And you know, we were talking about, you know, we're still learning, we're still going. What are some of the lessons that we've learned?
Two things for me. Um, one is I think that the initiatives that we have that have been very successful are successful because the teaching staff that has to implement them are incredibly passionate about it and believe in the work that they're doing with their students. We could have the greatest ideas, the greatest policy, but if the teaching staff who doesn't, who engage with students on a daily basis, who recruit, who support, who aspire, who interest and do all of those things, um, if, if they were not on board and on fire for the things that we're doing, then it wouldn't have the impact. And so I think the, a, a significant, we provide the resources, we provide the training, we provide the, the opportunity, but it's the, it's the teachers in the classroom every day that make it happen. And when they're on fire for it, all you have to do is go into a couple of health pathway classes or go into some of the business classes or go into the middle school fab labs and see the things they're doing. I mean, they're up, they're the first ones there. They're excited about the work that they're doing with kids and that translates to them. And I, that was a lesson for me that anything that we do has to have the teacher participation and the teacher buy-in. And I think it was big for us because we didn't try to uh, provide, get to equity before 2014, 15. We had been trying. And as you had said, sometimes the access just isn't enough. And I think having that third party expert, having the third party to give you, to do the research and give you research based strategies to say, if you do these things, if we, and we will help you, but we'll hold you accountable. You've got to do this and this and that to put our feet to the fire, but give us the, the, the strategies to do it. Uh, we found that with uh, our, our middle school work. I have found that with Lead Higher. I have found that with our Global Scholars Program. And all of those, it, Westerville is as good as you'll find, but that third party and teacher mm -hmm. buy-in, it, it just can't happen without that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's absolutely fascinating. And as we look further at alignment, and identifying the patterns that lead to successful recruitment and lead to successful retention. I am hoping that we continue, you know, we started, you know, in, in our high school stuff and we began, began to push down through the grades, push down into middle school, opening up those doors, creating those pathways, continually pushing down through the grades. And I'm hoping that I continue to see that alignment and that continued push and the continued look for patterns and ways to make things happen for kids as we move that on down, that push into elementary and back up again. Because what I imagine I would see and um, I will admit, I, I was writing all sorts of stuff at home before I left, and I called Kaylee and I said, I've got a whole list of questions, whole list of questions. And then I picked up the piece of paper and it said bread, cheese, <laughs> dog treats. I had brought the wrong piece of paper, and she was really happy when I told her that. But what I, what I was getting at uh, that I told her I wanted to ask you is, for instance, if we take and you may not have the data with you on this. One way I'm looking at that alignment and the success of it is, um, let's take ELA. So let's take the middle school ELA. And I'm asking Scott, not Kaylee, because it's not fair to ask your own daughter. Um, when we opened up those pathways at middle school, when we opened up the doors and said, self-select, if you think you can do advanced, you want to do this, let's get it done. One of the things I was looking at was performance in ELA. Because as we look at English and language arts performance, that tells me whether we are seeing the alignment and necessary patterns through our curricular delivery from the literacy strategies that were put in place in elementary. And I'm looking at Jen because she knows what I'm talking about here. So what I expect to see is those curricular delivery patterns, the curriculum itself, the resources that we provide in those earlier grades should mount to each other so that by the time they get to self-select, we should see the kids who self-select in that they're succeeding and doing well. So one of the things I would like us to look at is how our curriculum K-12 aligns and we see how the achievements occur and the students who are selecting into these programs and the students that we are recruiting in their attitudes. I'm not saying I'm asking you to give me that tonight, but that's just a pattern that I want us to look at. But this is so cool. 
with dog treats or no dog treats is just so cool. So if I could, three quick thoughts. Oh, can, can I? Oh, go ahead, Tracy. First? Sorry. Um, so first off, I love the enthusiasm from all four of you. It's, it's awesome. You can tell that you truly believe in it and you have a lot of passion behind it and I appreciate it and that's why it's so successful. Um, one quick question, and I, I agree with my colleagues here, but looking at alignment with student um, aspirations, where was teacher on there? Just curious, like we had the top five? It was like six or seven. Yeah, it was like right, I mean, we could have listed, it, it was right behind business. <clears throat> right okay, behind. because, all right. So that's great for our grow our own it. stuff as we think about that. That's a future presentation that. on the agenda coming forward higher. in a few I mean, weeks. That's who they're around every day and looking at kids I know, it would be high on that list. That's why I was a little surprised. Um, Love the list, appreciate it. So, all right, Dr. Kellogg, you. <laughs> So that one is coming in a future presentation from Dr. Hopkins and some work we're doing with a partnership and a grant. So just three quick things. You know, Scott and I, um, when I came on board and uh, the whole college career readiness thing was becoming a big push and we would have these conversations about, well, what does it mean for a kid to be college and career ready? And we kind of boil it down to a pretty simple concept, which is basically this. Your transcript is your currency. And how do you communicate to someone that your college and or career ready and really both and that's when we got into the idea of well it's really transcripted credit a kid has transcripted credit in AP college credit plus CTE whatever that is it's a currency that says this student has been through curriculum that prepares them in this realm and so that's where the push was okay increased coursework different kinds of opportunities within those, within those curriculum that have different flavors for depending on what kids interests are and aligning those pieces and I think that's what they've done very well so the growth has come from that piece um, the second one is about human capacity and changing the mindsets of ourselves around, well, what is this student capable of doing? And it always bothered me when we would artificially say to someone, no, that's not for you, when they're asking us to try something harder than what they're in. It just doesn't make any sense to me that you wouldn't give someone that opportunity. If it doesn't work it out, we punt and regroup and fix it. And we don't penalize and say, see, I told you so. And that, that's, that's, that's an attitude change and a, a change. And I think that's a big piece of what we've done. And the last one, which is just a simple rule for me, nobody gets better by putting more kids in low level courses. And if that's what we're going for, these opportunities. And the cool thing is, um, this went to scale of a previous experience I had as a principal that when you do open these opportunities for kids, they will go after it and they will flourish and they will knock your socks off and you'd be really surprised about their capacity as individuals and that's how we're going to get better and that's how we're going to improve their lives. So I appreciate the work that they're doing. We really, part of the message we want the board to have is we greatly appreciate your support of this, the resources you've allocated for this um, uh, along the way. Because you're right, there's been snippets, but this whole package tonight, which has been a little lengthy, but worth it, I think gives us full flavor about where we've, where we've come. And so kudos to all the staff out there who've made this work, um, and they've done fabulous work at, at the classroom level. We appreciate that and look forward to uh, additional progress moving forward. So thank you to the team. Thank you to the board. Sorry. Making a note to myself. Thank you so much. Um, 6.1, public comments pertaining to action items. We do not have any, which takes us to financials. 7.1, audit committee. And Ms. Marshall is just going to talk with us about this one. Uh, yeah, so it's that time of year again. Um, the auditors actually just started working with us today. They'll be here through the end of the week, and then they'll probably be touching back sometime after the um, actual comprehensive annual financial report has been completed with the gap side and the, uh, which will file by November the 30th and hopefully have our final audit done and completed by early January. So it's uh, due to the Government Finance Officers Association by December 31st to be considered for the award. So um, the audit committee this year, I've reached out to the same individuals that served on the audit committee last year and they all have agreed to serve again for another year. I spoke with the executive leadership team and um, we've all agreed that we're okay with that. So we're gonna continue on with the same group that we had from the previous year. 
Uh, they are, um, we have five individuals from the community, uh, Matt Bartosik, uh, Margaret Dune, Alfred Hammond, Keith Gaskins, and Eric Kyer. Um, and then the committee is also made up of myself, uh, Laura Hendricks, my assistant treasurer, and Deputy Superintendent Mark Hersheiser, and will be a board member, whoever gets selected <laughs> in January. Get excited. Um, <laughs> yes. So whoever gets ex uh, selected in January by whoever is board president in January. Um, our, uh, we meet post-audit with the auditors uh, in an audit conference to go over the final audit. And then we'll probably come back in February to present to the board someone will from the audit committee. So start thinking about it. <laughs> I Any can't think about it. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. 7.2, cafeteria plan. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Ms. Marshall, back to you. Yeah, so this is the um, IRS Section 125 cafeteria plan. This is the entire plan document. It allows for us to um, allow our employees to pay for their benefits on a pre-tax basis that's required under the IRS code for us to have a plan on file. Uh, we do have a change from what's been in place. The flexible spending account, uh, the contribution contribution maximum was $2,650, and the IRS increased it to $2,700 for calendar year 2020. So that's why you see that in front of you. And um, let me know if you have any questions about that. It's the same plan other than that, other than change. that change. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hearing none. Mr. Velarda? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Um, 7.3, amended appropriations for all funds for FY 2020. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And whenever you're ready. Yes. So this is amending our annual appropriations. Um, we have a few things. So the adjustment to the general fund is for the Central College demolition. Uh, back at the work session on April the 15th, the board had agreed that we would pay for that out of the general fund. It's a one-time expense. Um, <laughs> and then we also have several of our grants who had carryovers from the prior year, so they're just now available to the fund uh, this month, so we need to add those. And then the state budget added the student wellness and success funds. It's a new fund that we have to allocate because those funds are restricted. Um, I want to remind everybody what we ended up with with the state budget was flat funding for fiscal year 19, aside from a very small, less than 1% increase in the general fund. Um, and then these additional dollars, which are restricted for specific things. Um, and then we had some budget requests, additional budget requests for the student activities funds. Any questions? Okay. Mr. Bell? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Dr. Nasterbaker? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Velarda? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Um, personnel consent agenda, 8.1 through 8.10. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And Dr. Second. Hopkins is with us. Good evening again, President Davidson, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg, Ms. Marshall, I'd like to present for your consideration tonight's personnel consent agenda. Some of the highlights included in tonight's consent agenda are as follows. We have one retirement. Shirley Wilcox is re retiring from her transportation position on January 1st, 2020. She's worked over 19 years with our district, so we certainly thank her for her service. We have eight resignations from various classified and classified substitute positions. I'd like for you to be mindful that five of those individuals who are resigning are actually resigning from a sub position in our district to a more contracted position. So we're really excited about retaining these individuals. We have uh, one-time payments for staff who participated in professional development, the employment of 18 individuals in a number of classified and classified substitute positions. And finally, in the licensed employment section, we have one teacher being recommended for a replacement contract for the remainder of this year, and the employment of a number of people to various supplemental and classified pupil activity program positions. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Hearing none, thank you. Ms. Carter? Yes. 
Mr. Velarde? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Nesta Baker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. We do not have any old business. We do have some new business this evening. 10.1, first reading policy 211, parent and family engagement. And Juliet Peoples is going to come speak with us. Good evening, President Davidson and members of the board, Dr. Kellogg and Treasurer Marshall. I am bringing policy 2111, which is the parent and family engagement policy for your annual review. This is required by the Elementary Secondary Education Act and was amended in 2015 with the Every Student Succeeds Act. This policy outlines district and school expectations for cultivating relationships and partnerships with families and communities. This policy is shared with Title I building families and is required to be annually reviewed and updated based on feedback. At this point, there are no proposed changes during this evaluation cycle. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, 10.2, um, first reading policy 5200 attendance. Uh, Debbie Meisner is here. Good evening, President Davidson, members of the board. First reading for attendance policy 5200 uh, is being brought to you in order for us to add the recently um, enacted legislative move to require schools to contact parents within 120 minutes of the start of a school day when a student is absent. This uh, language is simply being added to this policy. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hearing none, thank you so much. Um, 10.3, first reading policy 7440.0. Zero 03 small unmanned aircraft systems um, well, and we're going to pass that over to Dr. Kellogg. Why is everybody giggling at that? This is a modern world, right? This is this is it comes from NASA. <laughs> I feel like Major Healy. Um, these are that's an old reference if you don't get it. And I it got up. it. That was pretty old, wasn't it? Sorry. I don't know so, that. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is just a policy related to the use of drones on school property and um, provides some clarification and requires prior prior permission for use in school property. So um, it's a new policy. First reading. Any questions? I'll be do my darnest to answer them. Otherwise, I'll move on. Have. Have we had any requests to this, We don't have a policy in place now, so the requests have been more at the building level. So this will now give us organization around how we go about this use. Where we're seeing it mostly that I've seen <coughs> athletic events. Mm -hmm. Okay. Enough said. Okay. Anybody else? 10.4, first reading policy 8500, food services. Dr. Kellogg, back to you. Thank you. So um, on this one, just a minor tweak um, language um, in the, looks like the first sentence of the first paragraph. Uh, we change the word lunch to meals. And then there's a couple other pieces. This is more just some compliance language, nothing spectacularly different in, in what we do in our operations. Uh, just a, a quick word on this. It, it it almost sounds silly, right? Lunch to meals. But the fact of the matter is that we have a population that is being served by breakfast out of need. So I, I, the first time I saw it, I snickered too. And then I realized that that meal was a needed thing. And so I... I I, I, I just want us to acknowledge that our schools are stepping up and making a difference in kids' lives beginning very early. Thank you. Um, we do not have any standing business this evening. Uh, up next is public comments, and we have one. Um, our only and first person is Veronica Knox. Just a friendly reminder, the timer will be shown on the screen. And you have five minutes. Hi, Board of Education. My name is Veronica Knox. I live in Westerville. I am a taxpayer. So it's come to my attention because I received a flyer for the levy, issue eight. 
and last week. And so in looking into it, it's come to my attention and many others that it cost the Board of Education $8,339 to complete those mailings. Is that correct? Is my first question. <laughs> we don't answer questions. Okay. Uh, but we will um, talk with you after, or if it's something we feel like we can answer now, we will, and I'm sure we can answer that one after. Um, okay. I know we can. My second comment is, is the board aware that according to the High Revised Code, Section 3315.07, Section C1, that it states, no Board of Education shall use public funds to support or oppose the passage of a school levy or bond issue. I, as a taxpayer, have an issue with taxpayers' monies being used for that purpose, for pro-levy communication to the taxpayers. That's my comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kellogg, I know you can answer this. I'm sure we can all answer this, but I'll let you start. And then if anyone else wants to chime in. Correct. I'm going to just uh, assume that the, the price is correct. Nicole would know best. In terms of the publication went out, it was a uh, non-position non issue. We're allowed to present factual information in the mailing to the community. This is really about informing the electorate. It went to all community members that are eligible voters. It wasn't to select target population. It was not designed to... Uh, tell people how to vote one way or the other. It's just factual information that's allowed by the actual uh, OCR regulations that were cited here. So um, I feel confident that what we put out there is, is uh, exactly what we're allowed to do. Anybody else? I guess I will say really quickly, I think people are um, a little confused if it would be levy information versus asking people to vote yes for the levy. So that's the difference. So putting out information to the public um, is very important. We do put information out to the public periodically. Uh, mailing it seems to be the best way. We can't put it, well, we struggle a little bit putting it in backpacks and as kids get older, they would never give it to their parents. So. And I, plus, I just, there are three quarters of the population that would never see a backpack anyway. Yes, I'm sorry, I uh, should have said that. No, that's, but yeah. you're absolutely right. And I know that it, there is confusion. There's also confusion about what the issue actually is. And yes. one of the things that the district can do and is legally permitted to do, as Dr. Kellogg was saying, is say, here's what the issue is. Here's why we are putting it on. Here's what it does. And that is the factual information that Dr. Kellogg is talking about versus the chatter and rumor and incorrect information that is out there. So that is why uh, we are permitted as a school district to put that information out there, the actual factual information, and why the board has chosen to put the issue on the ballot. So that's kind of what mm -hmm. it's about. It is, um, in a lot of ways, in my mind, it's always been unfair to expect people to go get the information themselves. Find it, figure out a way to get it. Instead, if we do what we are legally permitted to do and provide that in a non-targeted way to the voters of the community, then we have provided information that is a service to them, that is accurate information, that withstands scrutiny, legal scrutiny, academic scrutiny, all scrutiny that is there and provides people with information that they otherwise might not know where to look for and might instead resort to believing things that aren't necessarily accurate. I really appreciate the question. I want you to know that. And I've forgotten your first name. What's your first? Veronica. Um, uh, I appreciate the question. Um, and if you want to stick around for a few minutes, I'll be glad to talk to you some more. Um, th there, there is a distinction that we're trying to walk here. And I'll give you an example. Uh, as we sit here, we are not allowed to say uh, vote for the levy. We're not allowed to trumpet it, that kind of thing. Not even allowed to wear a, a button um, pro levy. Um, 
but the Ohio Revised Code that you cited, um, if if the if the uh, uh, mailers uh, were to be not factual but <coughs> were to be um, to propagandize, you must vote for this. Please vote for this instead of saying, uh, "Here is the percentage that you are taxed on." Um, here is the uh, uh, identification number of the ballot issue. Here is where the money will go. Um, to people who might not be in favor of that, it may appear as a proselytizing tool. But I would encourage you, and again, hang out if you want. I would encourage you to look at the pieces that the district puts out and see if it is not representative of factual information that we not only have the right to do, but I think the obligation to do. To say to the community, you have the right to know how much tax this will represent. You have the right to know how much this will represent on your, on your, on your, uh, uh, your market value, on, on your tax bill. You, you have the right to know all of that. And the district is the tool to get that information out. And then to say to the community, if you're already against it and it feels like a proselytizing tool, well, we, we sorry, but it in fact um, fulfills the obligation of the legal code and is, I'd encourage you to look at again, is it not based on simply providing information? But that's really why I appreciate the question in all seriousness. Because we, we, we want to be, we, we be transparent about this. You may not even agree with the answer. But my role, and I'm just saying me now, I don't speak for the board. I try not to speak for the board. The role is to, depri to try and provide factual, honest information. And then to leave that there. OK. Um, up next, board comments. Who would like to go first? I said enough tonight. No. I have one thing to say. Oh. During, during the presentation, College Credit Plus, AP, all of that. The last slide, uh, President Davidson, our austere leader, called you all out because teacher was not up there. Oh, I didn't call him out. Well, Von Bell whispered in my ear, well, where's the role of pastor up there? So I just, Von might not say that out loud, so I just thought I would <laughs> say that. And superintendent wasn't up there either. That's the story. We've t I've talked long enough. Thank you. Okay. Vaughn, anything? Okay. All right. Um, all right. 14.1. Uh, the Board of Education will meet in regular session on Monday, October 28th and Monday, November 18th, 2019 at 6 p.m. here at the Early Learning Center. And may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mr. Velarde? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. We're adjourned. 739. 739.